giving me the possibility to discuss uh, some other items related to artificial intelligence, and I will try to do in these uh, 20 minutes, uh, let's say, a summary on what are we what are we trying to do with artificial intelligence in clinical practice. So the topic will be related to uh, radiomics and imaging biomarkers and artificial intelligence on that items. And as a conflict of interest, I was co-founder of one of uh, the companies that is also here with artificial intelligence, but I do not have any shareholders with the company. And as learning objectives, I thought it would be nice to understand for all of you who are not familiar with imaging biomarkers and radiomics, what are they doing? Also to learn how artificial intelligence can be applied to obtain uh, those data and to learn also how artificial intelligence can improve the stepwise of uh, radiomics and biomarkers development and validation, and at the end also dealing with the concept of artificial intelligence in real-world data and real-world evidence and the use of biomarkers on that item. And before we go into that, let's uh, share why uh, there is a mass for imaging, maybe to understand what's happening in the huge diversity that we do have between people and between diseases and disorders. And we can explore what's happening in an individual patient just by taking a look to the genes, that's the genomics, to the proteins through proteomics, maybe metabolites, metabolomics, but we can also ask the tissues what are they expressing through imaging, and that's the role of radiomics. And maybe that's a field we do have in our hands through this personalized medical imaging to guess what's happening in the same way as René Magritte was painting a, a bird when he was looking at the egg. So in some way, if we are able to develop or implement these computer-based processes designed to analyze medical images, trying to depict or classify those tissue changes, we might have a nice tool in our hands to go towards personalized medicine through medical images. And the way to do that maybe uh, is related to this computational approach. And computational medical imaging is a science, which are uh, all the things related to, uh, to a science and methodology that evaluates the properties and the behaviors of tissues from their images, trying to describe those things that are relevant to the patient in a specific time of, uh, of the disease with both accuracy and truthfulness. And we do that asking the tissues and the lesions through computerized modeling trying to extract this high-dimensional data, which at the end will be mineable form, and that will allow us to uh, build these models, descriptive and predictive models, which are called biomarkers. So what are biomarkers at the end? Biomarkers are those measures, like the ones we obtain from blood samples, that are characteristics, indicators of whatever normal biological processes or pathological changes or maybe pharmaceutical responses. And if we apply imaging to biomarkers, then we should have subrogated features and parameters that are obtained from those images and will give us quantitative information on both the regional distribution, that means they are resolving a space and we can evaluate heterogeneous distribution of whatever we are taking a look at. And also, they are resolved on time because we do not destroy the samples and we can evaluate those longitudinal changes whenever we want. 
And how can we use these biomarkers? Well, we can use them to make diagnosis of phenotyping, meaning maybe trying to detect or confirm the presence of a disease or to identify different disease subtypes why a tumor is uh, responding to a treatment while other tumors from the same uh, category are not. Also, susceptibility or the potential to develop a disease, like a fracture with osteoporosis. Predictive, trying to link the biomarker to a treatment effect, either uh, on the good or the bad way. And that means within predictive uh, response, but also safety, uh, which is the extent of toxicity as an ad uh, adverse effect. And also we can have biomarkers if we are lucky on prognostic, meaning the likelihood of a final endpoint, which would be disease recurrence or progression or patient survival, might be predicted at the beginning of the disease just by taking a look to the lesions or the organs where the abnormalities are present. And this is what we do have in real day practice. We have so many different images obtained from so many different modalities and sequences. They, are, uh, they have so many information channels, which are the way we acquire those images. We then, then need uh, image preparation, which means registration, denoising, resizing, uh, intensity normalization, and of course, we need tissue segmentation. We need to uh, take out the organ we want to evaluate or the tumor we want to see what happens with uh, that tissue on as uh, automatic as a possible way. And once we have the region we want to evaluate, we can go through picture feature attributes, which is mainly radiomics, and that goes into morphology or semantics the spatial distribution of the signal intensity and the histogram distribution with so many different uh, texture features that we can obtain from organs and uh, tissues. But we can also go through the dynamic model parameters, meaning that on that region of interest or volume of interest, we can calculate again so many other uh, uh, features that might describe what's going to happen with that lesion. And if we calculate parameters on those parametric images, we can again go into histogram uh, distribution statistics or a spatial distribution uh, future metrics. And from that, if we do data reduction, because there is a huge amount of data here, and if we apply either statistics or multivariate analysis or classifiers, uh, clustering uh, signatures, we might be lucky and link whatever we have here with that diagnosis, predictive, or prognostic endpoints that are of our interest, and then we will have biomarkers. And those biomarkers need external validation. So validation is extremely important. We do have either technical validation, which deals with variability, either precision or stability and accuracy. And at the end, the most important maybe, which are the clinical validation. That means the relevance of those findings we have from images and their correlation with the clinical endpoints and the impact on the healthcare pathways. So these are just short examples. We can have texture analysis of metastasis within the liver, and through this, some parameters, we might be able at the beginning to classify the lesions into those that will respond and those that will not. That's quite good for us. The bad thing is that there is a huge of variability in the things we are doing, mainly related to the acquisition parameters. If we change the repetition time, the echo time, the flip angle, the thickness, the sequence, the parameters will change. The processing techniques and methods, the filters we are using, the quantitative
excitation levels, uh, the uh, depth of the image a bit, that will change, and of course, on the number of teacher features. So variability is huge. If we go into the signal dynamic parameters, like the ones we can obtain with the intravoxelin current motion on the diffusion weighted sequences, we can have so many different parameters that have been linked to aggressiveness, as an example, on prostate cancers. But again, we have a huge amount of variability on this approach because the V values we are using, the distribution of those V values, the signal strengths, the amount of noise will change the parameters. And also the processing methods we are using, the registration on the different V values, the signal fitting or the average, and the lesion type. So there are so many va variables that will change the results we are obtaining. This is an example of a prostate cancer with diffusion and contrast enhanced dynamics. This is the cellularity maps obtained from V through the intravoxelin coil motion and the permeability K-trans obtained through a pharmacokinetic modeling after contrast media administration. And if we perform a multivariate or multi-parameter nosologic maps, we can obtain those areas with high cellularity and high permeability, which are the most aggressive ones. But variability here will have the variability of both techniques altogether. So we should ask, do we have the right answers by using texture analysis of future properties or parameters from signal dynamics? Can all this process be improved to be used in clinical practice? Or why the best answers to the right question is still brown? And brown means that we have a huge amount of variability on what we are doing. So we have to look for truth variability and certainty. And we have to recognize that for anything we do measure from images, um, to be representative of a physical reality, it must have a clear relationship with what we are measuring. And in images, signal comes from voxels. Within the voxels, we have a huge amount on complex structures with different properties and components, and they are obtained with different machines, so it's close to impossible to have a standardized image processing or image acquisition or image parameters. In real practice, also the evidence coming from variability and certainty, if we, are, if we want to infer casual relationships in medicine, we go mainly through experimental prospective studies, mainly with a controlled clinical studies and on randomized uh, clinical trials. And that's on the highest level of evidence. But retrospective cohorts are lower, although the level of evidence is also nice. So maybe we can also go through this retrospective observational studies that can be longitudinal with cohorts, and we can use them to have evidence. But let's think if these results coming from research, if they are universal, if they are reproducible, can they be validated? Are they relevant to the whole population? And on that thought, there is an extremely nice paper published in Nature dealing with the scientific reproducibility crisis. And that crisis means asking authors that have published in Nature that most of them recognize that it will not be possible to have a reproducible results. That means that results on the highest impact factor publication cannot be reproduced. If we think that relates to the field is not true because most of the uh, science, the fail to reproduce an experiment goes close to 60 percent. 
So maybe we are not doing the things on the right way. And maybe the reason for that is that uh, pretending that evidence-based medicine that comes from prospective studies and randomized clinical trials mainly will give an answer to the clinical decisions uh, that will be not be the real situation. And we do recognize that there is more and more interest on using the real world data to address these questions. And the good thing of real world data and retrospective studies is that although we have data heterogeneity, that means we need to control data quality, we have a large sample of uh, reproducible if it comes from the real world. So how can we do that and link large repositories with uh, radiomics and imaging biomarkers? First, we need the databases, these large repositories. And the sources for that are registries from clinical trials, we can use them, registries from rare diseases all over continents, and we can use them, public and open access biobanks, like uh, there's so many different ones we do have in Europe, someone related to aerobioimaging, the radiological information system, the electronic health records on the uh, uh, health uh, systems, and at the end our objective is to have data as large as possible, complete, adequate for what we are doing, organized, and standardize in some way after uh, data curation. And we can have a huge amount of evidence uh, that will allow us to uh, infer relationship if we eliminate systematic confounding, trying with this real world data to emulate randomized clinical trials. And how do we do that? We have to take care in patients' recruitment participant sampling, data collections, reference standards, technical specifications, definitions of units and categories, the number and expertise of the persons, the blindness of what we are doing, and these are the, uh, the results. And with all those things, do we have now that we are asking the real world population what's happening there, the right answer, or can we further improve this process? And I think, or we think in our uh, environment, that maybe artificial intelligence is the answer because it can provide a lower variability and better reproducibility of the results. And we are working with artificial intelligence mainly in virtual lesions from images and also a virtual biopsy meaning that we want to this virtual dissection, we can use the uh, deep uh, supervised uh, networks, and that will give us a segmentation of the liver that can be used to quantify fat and ion on an extremely fast way. And we can also have so many different source images. We can obtain so many different radiomics data and dynamic modeling and extracted from those images. But if we want to go through lesion phenotype, tumor habitats, invasion, progression, recurrence, symptoms relief, survival, quality of life, just by taking a look to the tumors at the beginning, maybe we need artificial intelligence because that will give us a massive analysis of uh, data, source data and derived data a false discovery correction, analysis also of the biomarkers and the link uh, them to the uh, endpoints. This is an example of a virtual biopsy. This is a prostate. We use a neural network to segment the tumor and also to calculate in prospective data. 
we have to uh, take care of the data we have. We have to uh, define the exclusion criteria. Then we have the training data, the testing data for fine tuning, and then the external validation, which is a must. And for those things, the internal and the external validation, we have so many different methods and metrics that have to be used to have high quality results. So this is the retrospective studies and best data uh, driven by artificial intelligence. And we do recognize that this heterogeneity on images from different technologies, vendors, and protocols the uh, technological advances and improvements that means that whatever we do will be different in a two years basis. There is no way to standardize image quality. I mean, that's always changing. And because of that, maybe the use of artificial intelligence could be destructive because it will give us, through uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, results that will have lower variability and better uh, reproducibility. And these are examples on some projects we do have. This is for um, prostate. We perform with artificial intelligence prostate segmentation, and we can calculate nosologic images that learn from the models we did handcrafted. And at the end, we link that to the clinical and genomic and pathological endpoints and we are constructive, predictive, and prognostic models that will give us information on the aggressiveness on those tumors based on artificial intelligence. And this is the, large, uh, the last project we are, and we are sharing with uh, Professor Neri, coming from Horizon 2020, where we are on a large uh, uh, database of patients with neuroblastoma all over Europe. We are uh, doing handcrafted for uh, radiomics and dynamic signal analysis, then data reduction. And then we use either conventional statistics, multi-scale models, artificial intelligence, or visual analytics to link these things to phenotyping, treatment allocation, or prognosis. Uh, models with uh, an external validation. But we do think that we can apply deep learning and convolutional neural networks not only to the classifier, also to the extraction of radiomics and biomarkers on a more reproducible uh, way. And this is our last project. And I just want to finalize thanking uh, Angel Alberic and Ana Jimenez, who are here, for their help in pushing these artificial imaging solutions into real daily work practice in a hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Luis Marti Bonmati, for this uh, excellent lecture.